Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Abbas Dalaeddin. And on today's episode of Dissecting Apologetics, we will be watching a video by Zakir Naik, featuring Zakir Naik. Uh, last week's live stream was also about Zakir Naik. Today's clip is from 2010, so it's 14 years old at this point, but it is still very relevant. Uh, and it shows how Zakir Naik hasn't changed very much as a person in 14 years, which is pretty sad. So without, I, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to elongate the introduction for too long. I just want to say before we begin that it is not a habit of mine to call someone names or to call a sheikh an imbecile. But in this case, I think it is very, very much deserved. And you'll see why in a few minutes. Uh, I just want to make it clear that I think he's an imbecile because of how he talks, because of how he thinks, not necessarily because he is religious. And I want to make that distinction very clear. So the person who challenged Zakir Naik in this clip as he was giving a lecture. Uh, Zakir Naik has this habit of opening up the floor to questions. And he doesn't really do a good job of actually addressing the questions, not just if it's a question challenging his position as a Muslim preacher, uh, but even if it's a question by another Muslim. He simply, if you watched last week's live stream, uh, you should do so right now, actually. Uh, he just uses it as a chance to listen to his own voice. He likes his voice very much. He tends to miss the point of the question, whether it's being asked by a Muslim or otherwise. And in this video clip from, like I said, 14 years ago, Zakir Naik was asked a question by a brave Maldivian atheist. For those of you who don't know that much about the Maldives, it is a country that is on paper 100% Muslim. So this guy was extremely brave, albeit a bit reckless to ask this question out in public. And we'll see a little bit more about his story and what transpired because of this interaction. So without further ado, let's see what Zakir Naik had to say to this man. Um, Dr. Zak Naik, Zakir Naik, um, I'm a Maldivian. I'm still struggling to believe in religion. That's why I just came to the front of this row um, I was born a Maldivian. Uh, my parents taught me the religion Islam. They are good practitioners, actually. Um, I have read a lot of bo books. I have uh, read the translation of Quran. Yet, I still don't believe in a religion. So, what do you see um, as my verdict in Islam? Because Maldives is definitely uh, Muslim state. Okay. So before we listen to Zakir Naik, let's recap what was said because Zakir Naik doesn't do a good job of comprehending what was said. So this man, Muhammad Nazim, said that he was uh, raised as a Muslim. His parents are Muslims. Everyone in, in the Maldives is presumed to be Muslim, and we'll see why later. And that he read books about Islam. He didn't specify which ones. He read translations and he doesn't believe in it. And his question here is not, um, is Islam true or not? His question is not, am I right or are you right? He's asking, what do you think should happen to me since I live in a country, the Maldives, which he called it a Muslim state? And we'll focus on the semantics a, a little bit later. So that's, again, a refresher of what the guy asked, what Muhammad asked. And let's hear what Zakir Naik will answer. Can you, answer the, can you ask the question again? My question is, I am a Maldivian. Yes. I don't believe in religion. Yes. What do you think my verdict would be since Maldives is 100% Muslim, as many claim, but I don't believe so. so. So, hear that? He said, what is my verdict? That is the core of the question. The, the microphone, please. I request the sound person not to switch off this microphone. Keep the microphone on, no problem. Keep it always on 100%. Don't put on and off. Don't fiddle with the switch. Keep it on always, please. Yes. The other microphone on the questions, you can put on and off. My microphone, keep it on always. Right. Right. Allah, it. It. Zakir. The brother posed the question. He's a Maldivian, born to a religious family. He was Muslims. He read, he read books on Islam. He read the Quran, but doesn't believe in religion. What is his status? So you have to go and ask the government. Well, the government tells me 100% Muslim. Now you say one non-Muslim is there. 
if you don't believe in religion what don't you believe in islam or don't believe in religion if you don't believe in islam that means you're not a muslim no you're not a muslim i am not ha huh. so then you have to go and ask the maldivian government i'm not a muslim what you should be do i don't know whether they'll take away your nationality or not i don't know to so know your opinion about i mean if he had stopped there that that would be it's sleazy enough that he's dodging the question i mean he could say i know nothing about the maldivian government and that's valid uh, but he could still answer the question in the form of what would happen to me if i live in a country that has sharia law in its constitution but at, at first he said go ask the government but what does he say next about apostasy does does that come on me or do you think that i was a muslim because i just was born to muslim parents and because maldives is a 100% muslim state sorry i don't want to say 100% a muslim state yeah and and that's a good point uh, zakat makes a joke that the maldives is is 100% muslim except one uh, but i know personally maldivian ex muslims or that that's actually the core of the question here is he considered an apostate or an ex muslim if he didn't really believe he was just born a muslim born to muslim uh, family members and in a muslim family so th- that is the core of the question does he get treated like an apostate if he never believed to begin with 100% minus 1 <laughs> whatever and it, this may seem like a joke 100% muslim minus 1 but it's not a joke people can't come out and say openly that they're not muslim because of repercussions and we'll talk about that in detail i have references that's what i love about doing this show is i bring more references than those dawa men giving lectures about islam and today i'll show you references uh not islamic references necessarily but references about the maldives that was the question what is the state in islam or apostasy <clears throat> since i was born as a muslim see quran a beloved prophet muhammad that's not exactly the question the question was does it count that i'm an apostate if i never believed i was just born in a muslim family sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that every child is born as a muslim muslim means person who submits his will to god person who submits his will to god is called as a muslim later on is influenced by his teachers by his parents and then he may deviate do idol worship do fire worship therefore when a person a non muslim becomes a muslim the more appropriate word is revert rather than convert so um once you say my prophet said your opinion is pretty much invalid because it is an opinion it's not a fact he believes as a fact because muhammad said that people are born muslims and that is true and i think that is just hijacking like they use this word fitra to to attribute anything that is innate or anything that is biologically innate or learned from from society to some innate quality that god put in you and they say that your fitra your innate quality is that you are a muslim and then that changes because of the people around you but citation needed and to say that my prophet said so is not is not a citation in this day and age i mean it may work for this guy who is allegedly a medical doctor but i don't think that would work in the medical field either as far as islam about apostasy that you are talking about death penalty are you talking about death penalty i mean he just asked you am i considered an apostate or not but sure verdict for apostasy is what is the verdict now ask me what is your knowledge you read books on islam what is your verdict as far as i know it is death ah uh, so why don't you go and say that <laughs> the... wait what's what's funny about this i i somehow seem to have missed this point so he challenges him he said you read a lot of books you tell me and and he knows the answer i think anyone knows the answer it's not that difficult to know and then he laughs as far as i know it is death ah uh, so why don't you go and Say that. <laughs> why don't you go and what? Why don't you go and off yourself? Why don't you go and tell the government to off you? Whoa. Can't you finish that that sentence, Zakir? The problem is knowledge of Islam is weak. What you have done, brother, you have read wrong books on Islam. Now, because you read wrong books on Islam, therefore we have deviated from Islam. So- hold up, hold up, hold up. So he asks him a question. The guy answers correctly. He doesn't say, you know what? Looks like you actually know what you're talking about, or you seem to be correct about this one thing. He says your knowledge about Islam is weak. How have you surmised that? He hasn't said anything so far that that challenges your position on Islam. He hasn't said anything that you deemed incorrect, Zakir. But you say you read the incorrect books. He hasn't cited one book that he read. Yet this man knows with absolute certainty that he read the wrong ones. How do you know that? 
he answered your question correctly. So my request to you is read current books about Islam. Inshallah, you will come back to Islam. So my request to, for you is you may be saying your parents are. So what you're doing is you're rejecting the wrong Islam. And even I reject wrong Islam. And everybody claps. That, that's the scary part. The crowds, they lap this stuff up. They, they just clap and clap. All he said was, you have the wrong version of Islam and you're wrong. Um, you didn't even, you haven't had a discussion with him about Islam. So you have read wrong books. Maybe you read Western books. Maybe you read books on Islam that are criticizing Islam. And you hear that. Uh, maybe you read Western books. First of all, how do you know that? Uh, and secondly, just because it came from the so-called West doesn't mean that it's incorrect. I mean, most of the medical knowledge that that he probably had to go through, if he's actually a doctor, if he's actually an accredited doctor, does have sources that are Western. Does that mean that his title that he loves to tout as a doctor is invalid because it's a Western title based on many um, sources of information that are Western? And then he says, you might have read books that criticize Islam and automatically that makes them invalid because they criticize Islam. You read wrong books, maybe you read Western books, maybe you read books on Islam that are criticizing Islam. Okay, I, I think... People might think that I'm being too pedantic here, but I don't. It's important to read the words and what's in between the words. Uh, maybe you have read a book that is critical about Islam. He's saying that any book that is critical of Islam is invalid automatically. He didn't even ask him what's the title of the book, who's the author. Um, there's, you know, he didn't even challenge his position on on his knowledge. He just said if a book is critical on Islam, then it is incorrect. And it is invalid. And your information about Islam is automatically invalid. It's important to read what's in between the words. And you got so much influenced. You, say you got influenced. We hear that a lot. Who, how do you know that? Your parents are religious. Maybe they are. I don't know. But if you have been influenced by the wrong practice of Islam, that's the reason you're rejecting wrong Islam. So instead of answering the question, he says, maybe you read wrong books. Uh, maybe your parents might have been Muslim, but the wrong kind of Muslim, or they didn't teach you the right thing. Brother, brother asked a good question. Why don't you answer the good question that the brother asked? What I want you to tell me, in this talk of mine, I will come to your answer. About apostasy, I'll come to I highly doubt that, but okay. I'm not running away from the answer. I'm asking you, in this talk of mine, what did you find what was illogical? About trying to convince a robber that there is life after? Yes. What happened? What right or wrong? I don't think you can convince him. No, you tell me one thing and why robbing is bad. You so oh, wait, wait, so this is referencing a part of the talk that we didn't listen to because it's not in this video, but apparently he was trying to convince a robber about the afterlife and somehow if he convinced him of the afterlife, then he would stop being a robber or something. Um and he's saying I mean, Zakir Naik is inviting him to find a problem with the stuff that he said earlier, which I think, again, is dodging the question. But he says, I don't think what you said is convincing. You did. Can you give me a reason without life after death? Can you prove to a robber who is intelligent, who is logical and says why it is bad for him? He's not talking bad for others. He's saying prove to you. You should prove to him why it is bad for me if I am a robber. Without life after that, you cannot prove at all. Give me one reason. I don't know. You have not been able to convince me. So not con <laughs> Before Zakir starts shouting again. Yeah, this is, a, this is a good question. Why is the Sheikh so angry? Um, he, he was asked a question that, that was very easy to answer, and he just got very upset. Basically, what he's trying to say is there is no morality unless there's an afterlife, and you can't convince uh, someone who steals that it is bad for them to steal, which I think, again, is an incorrect question. Whenever you get asked a question, especially in response to a question by one of these Dawah guys, try to remind yourself, what are we here to discuss? And this, correct, this, this question is incorrect. A robber could possibly for example, never be convinced that stealing is bad for him. It's only bad for other people. And that still has nothing to do with the validity of an afterlife. Even if we imagine that the only way to solve the problems in this world are to is to believe in an afterlife, that still doesn't prove an afterlife. That just means it's convenient to believe in an afterlife. It doesn't prove anything. But why is he putting this guy on the spot, asking him a question, and then not even letting him 
talk just to, to get angry at him. Don't convince me. You convince me why it is wrong. I am convinced me why it is wrong. Okay, calm down, Zakir. I'm not claiming anything here. I'm telling I'm a robber. I'm intelligent. According to you, robbing okay, is... Okay, that finally, Zakir and I can agree. He is a robber. He, he is a thief. He, he is getting paid a lot for, for this this uh, tomfoolery of his. So I, w- I would say, and this is an accusation from me, this is not proven, I think that on some level, Zakir Naik is a thief because he is stealing time and attention and money from people and giving them this drivel in response. So finally, we agree. Robbing is good or bad? I'm sorry we are going into a debate. I'm I don't asking think we you, need this. is robbing good? answer my question. Is robbing good or bad according to you? Bad. So you say it is bad without reason. That means you're a logical person. Thank you, you very much. much. And everybody claps. You say robbing is bad without reason. You're, you're a logical person. That's not even the question. You said you cannot, I don't, you don't have to convince me. That means you're saying things which you don't have to convince anyone, things which are not logical. So if I- Nobody has to convince you of anything. He didn't come and tell you Islam is false and I'll show you why. He just said, what is, what is my position? Am I to be treated as an apostate? He didn't even ask him, what is the penalty for an apostate? He asked him, should I be treated as an apostate if I was never a believer in, in the first place? So if I give an answer, wait, wait, I'm going to give an answer. Again, you say you're not convinced. I'm not- that is the dumbest rationalization I've ever heard. Wait, let's, let's hear that again. Sir, wait, wait. I'm going to give an answer. Again, you say you're not convinced. If I give you an answer, how dare you say you're not convinced? I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling to follow with, with this logic. Does he think that if he, as long as his answer sounds good to him, that it, that means that it's automatically logical or that it should make sense to everyone else? What am I going to do? If a person doesn't know maths, I'm saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. I'm not convinced. What am I going to do? Again, all the, all the laughing and clapping in the background. Again, asking a question that has nothing to do with anything. He says, if someone is not convinced that 2 plus 2 equals 4, then they're an illogical person. But is there anything about Islam that is as simple and as easy to prove as 2 plus 2 equals 4? Here, I can show you with items on my desk how 2 plus 2 equals 4. 1, 2... And what else? Three, four. Here are four items. Add them together it equals four. There you go. Proved with facts and logic. You can't do that with Islam. You will never be able to do that with Islam or any other religion because religion is not about proof. And in Islam especially, it's always about scaring people into, um, in, into just avoiding to think about how there is no proof. So how did we get here, Zakir Naik? What was the original question again? <laughs> So the problem is the problem is you have to be educated from starting from the scratch. Time doesn't permit in question answer time to educate you from the scratch. The problem is that you have to be educated from this from the scratch. Meaning you have to be educated from the foundation. You have to, and he doesn't have time in this short Q and A to educate this guy. But it seems like he has more than enough time to dodge the question. You may have got. Can I, a what, can I ask you one specific no, question? No, you cannot. Fine. You have to go behind the queue sure. and wait for your time. Fine. I have to wait, answer your question on apostasy. Apostasy and apostasy. By the way, um, the people that are shouting in the background, they're shouting threats at the guy. They're shouting to have him removed. They're shouting to have him punished. That's just, isn't it scary to live in an environment where everyone can that quickly flip on you and is out to get you. And you'll see in a little bit how bad this was. This interaction, because of the way Zakir Naik is behaving, because of how he painted this guy as some illogical, boastful, uneducated, uh, incorrect, and maybe even hateful person, he turned the people against him, the people who, who just needed that tiniest little push. To, to be that dogmatic about things. Um, this is why Zakir Naik is dangerous. I put a poll. If you disagree with me, answer the poll in the live chat. Do you think Zakir Naik is dangerous? I mean, it, he is kind of an imbecile. He is a fool. He is. It's fun to laugh at him, but this has real world consequences and even fools can be dangerous. And that's, that's my opinion on that. Apostrophe. As far as apostasy, a person who is a Muslim and becomes a non-Muslim in Islam, there are many cases, it doesn't mean that penalty. It's not that penalty. There were cases in which Sahabas, 
when the Prophet told that this person who was a Muslim became a non-Muslim, kill him. So one of the Sahaba says, he's my relative, let him go. The Prophet agreed. So it's compulsory death penalty is not there. But if the person... Hold up, hold up, hold up. So he says the death penalty is not compulsory because of an example that he doesn't properly cite. He doesn't tell us which hadith this is. But allegedly, a time that someone wanted to get some kafir killed and a guy appealed to the prophet a muslim appealed to the prophet and said this is, he, he's my relative please spare him and the prophet said fine he's spared how is that an argument in any way or how is that relevant to any of this we don't have muhammad today to spare the apostates who have relatives who appease him uh so they shift the goalposts so far that they make it seem they make it seem like they have a point. So, yeah, it's so if you're related to a Muslim and if you happen to have Muhammad's contact information and if you happen to convince him not to kill you, then you might not necessarily be murdered uh, or punished. Person who reverts, who was a Muslim, then converts to and becomes a non Muslim and propagates his faith and speaks against Islam. And if it's Islamic rule, then the person should be put to death. Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's uh, dissect that a second. So he says, let, let's hear it again. Not there, but if the person who reverts, who was a Muslim, then converts to... It's getting really confusing the way that they're using the word revert. So like he explained earlier, they say someone who converts to Islam for the first time is a revert because they were born a Muslim and then they left, which is a myth. Um, but he here he's saying reverts as in left Islam. Maybe he misspoke, but he's saying if someone left Islam. And becomes a non-Muslim and propagates his faith and speaks against Islam. And propagates his faith. But what if his faith is just that I don't believe in Islam? I think that's what he means by, pay, by faith. And if it's Islamic rule, then the person should be put to death. But just because of... Okay. If someone criticizes Islam, they should be put to death. If it is as an Islamic rule. He said that, not me. Person who is a Muslim becomes a non-Muslim death penalty is not the ruling. Okay, guys, we are safe. As long as you keep your little mouth shut, as long as you don't say anything bad about Islam, as long as you don't propagate your faith. If you're living in a Muslim, in, in a land uh, uh, ruled by Sharia law or by Muslim law, as long as you s stay quiet, shut up, they may not kill you. The government may not kill you. How generous, Zakir Naik. Wow, Islam is such a peaceful religion. I didn't know that there was such leeway in this gorgeous, beautiful religion of yours. But if a person in the Islamic state of law, which follows Quran and Sunnah, follows Quran, huh? constitution should be Wait, Quran. Let's, let's pause for a second, because I think we let people get away with a lot of, it, only in an Islamic state bullshit. Um, can you imagine if I got on a mic today and I said, in a apostate state, or in a Christian state, or whatever religion I, I start, in a, um, uh, what, was that? what was that religion that was made up, the uh, Pastafarian, is, is that it? The, uh, the, whatever, whatever religion I say, in my state, we will execute you if you're a Muslim, or we will execute you if you're not a follower of this religion, or if you propagate your faith, but only under my laws. Would anyone let me get away with that? Would anyone view me as a you know, a propagator of a peaceful religion? No. So why do we give them a pass? Why can someone say you're safe as long as it's not an Islamic state? And in the same breath, we're supposed to not be afraid when Muslims want more rights for their religion and more freedom to practice their religion. I am torn because I don't want people to view Muslims as dangerous because most Muslims are not like this guy. But when he is a spokesperson for a lot of Muslims and a lot of people in the crowd are foaming at the mouth to hurt this guy, who asked the question, a simple question, which he proved the point, then what am I supposed to say? It is dangerous to live in a land where Islam is the majority, where Islam is has anything to do with the law, which is why I believe in a secular state. Religion of any sort, be it Islam, be it Christianity, be it Judaism, whatever it is, has no place in ruling people because not everyone agrees that this is the, the system that they want to follow. And we should never, ever use God told me in a dream or God told the guy who told the guy who told the guy in a cave 
as basis for any rules that we live by. That should never be the way forward. And as we can see, a lot of countries with a lot of Muslim people are actually kind of secular, but also they have religious laws. There is no way forward unless we make it secular, unless we make laws that are best for everyone as much as we can make it best for everyone, not on the basis of God told me in a dream. That's delusion. So he says, based on my delusional uh, way of running a country, you'd be executed. The Quran, not Muslim state, Islamic state. There's a difference between a Muslim state and an Islamic state. Muslim state means majority are Muslims. Islamic state means people follow Islam. So okay, now, now he's bullshitting. He says, Muslim state is a state where the majority are Muslims. Islamic state is one where Islam is in the law. I, I don't know if that um, semantic difference is actually relevant because I, I, I refuse to believe that he's that stupid or that ignorant. But the Maldives is an Islamic state. It's not just a Muslim state as he defines it, as in most people are Muslim, so we'll call it a Muslim state. No, Islam is deeply rooted in their uh, in, in their laws. And we'll talk about that in a second with references. So Maldives is a Muslim state, not Islamic state. Incorrect. Factually incorrect. You know that Maldives is a Muslim country. I'm, I'm assuming the atheist is clapping. Muhammad Nazim is clapping because he wants he wants he wants the Maldives to be a state that sure, most people are Muslim, but it should not be in the laws. That's why he's clapping. It should not be an Islamic state, but it is an Islamic state. It's a Muslim country. If you were an Islamic country, if you were in the Islamic country, you would have been questioned. We have a freedom of expression. That is interesting. If you're in an Islamic country, you would have been questioned. Guess who gets questioned right after this, this performance? Guess who? If you're in the Islamic country, you would have been questioned. We have a freedom of expression. But freedom of expression is limited. <laughs> you have freedom, but it is limited. And, and, and I believe in that concept to an extent. You don't have the freedom to go threaten someone and say, I want you dead. You don't have the freedom to yell fire in a crowded theater and get people hurt. But he's saying you don't even have the freedom to openly advocate for your faith or to leave a religion and criticize it. That is not called freedom at this point. You don't have freedom of expression. You have a certain uh, set of statements that you can make, all of them positive about Islam. And if you deviate from that, then you will be punished. You'll be questioned in an Islamic state, which he claims the Maldives is not. It's limited. As I told you, That's I don't know of any country, Muslim country, would have been questioned. We have a freedom of expression, but freedom of expression is limited. Is limited. As I told you, I don't know of any country in the world which is 100% Islamic. Again, that is an asinine distinction. I don't know of any country which is 100% Islamic, as in they have no laws that are not derived from Sharia. Uh, newsflash, Islam came at a time where people lived in the desert. People didn't have, like development wasn't uh, at the point that it is right now. We have a lot, a lot of things. Almost all of our laws have nothing to do with what Allah said or Muhammad said. Even in a Muslim country, he did not fathom what a speeding ticket is. <laughs> what you think people running around on camels and, and Allah said in a verse that if you ride your camel faster than this pace is, you get a speeding ticket. Most laws have nothing to do with Islam. So no, you will not be in a country that is 100% based on Islamic law unless you live, you lived 1400 years ago. So that is an asinine distinction to make. Uh, but even if you live in a country that is not necessarily uh, based on Sharia law, even if it's on paper a secular country, you can have a majority Muslim population. You can have a, a, a mentality that is spread among them that you can and should harm an apostate. Or only if it was written in our laws, we would have this guy executed. And you know what happens when you convince people that if only over a technicality, you're not executed, people will find a way to harm you. If not execute you, then they'll find a way to harm you physically or otherwise. Because you've made it okay. You are said that under a different law system, this person deserves death. It's similar to how 
in, in a prison, for example, some people go to prison, like people who go to jail or prison go for many different reasons. It might be embezzlement. It might be a violent crime. It might be a nonviolent crime. But some people go for, for very violent and despicable crimes that even criminals in prisons, even thieves, hate those people. And I'm not going to give an example, but you can think of some horrible examples. There is no codified uh, code or law that says in a prison you can attack or murder someone who is extremely abhorrent. But people do it anyway. Why? Because we've said that someone who has committed such heinous crimes is so terrible, is so terrible that they deserve terrible things. And people will act on that even if it is not a law. So what he did right here and what Islam does is convince people that someone like this guy who asked the question, someone who is openly atheist or criticizes Islam or openly not Muslim, deserves terrible things if a technicality were different. And some people will not wait for that technicality. Some people will not wait, even in Islamic State, will not wait for the state to carry the penalty. People will find a way to harm that person, if not physically, then otherwise. That is the harm. We often focus on the question of, how many people were executed by the Islamic uh, State or by the government last year? How many, how many people were punished legally by the law? Oh, it's not such a big number, sometimes because of underreporting and sometimes because, yeah, they didn't actually cite that very specific law as they were punishing the person. But how could you, you could harm an apostate or a critic of Islam, even a progressive Muslim, in so many ways without ticking the box of, oh yeah, we're going to lash him or we're going to uh, execute him because of this specific apostasy law. So focusing just on how many people were executed under this one law is not productive. There's so many ways to ostracize an apostate or someone who is not behaving a way that a Muslim should. So many more ways than just the death penalty. So I implore you, whenever you hear this brought up as in oh, we haven't used the death penalty in a while, or it's only under very stringent conditions or anything else, like the stoning uh, punishments or the lashing punishments. It hasn't happened in a while. But when you tell people that someone deserves it to happen, if only for a technicality, then people will find a way to harm that person in other ways. That's what I wanted to say about that. Now, before you go, I want to show you a couple of um, write-ups here that give a little bit more information about what happened. So first, this is from an interview with uh, Muhammad Nazim. This was at a um, uh, th th this is a, a newspaper in the Maldives called Minivan News. So I want to read a bunch from here and bear with me as we go through this together. Revelations of a former apostate. Muhammad Nazim speaks to Minivan. He's a former apostate, and we'll see why. Nazim, now often referred to as the apostate by many, openly expressed doubts over his belief in, in, in Islam at a public lecture given by Zakir Naik. I refuse to call him doctor. An Indian religious speaker towards the end of May this year. Days later, Nazim re-embraced re Islam equally publicly, having received counseling from religious scholars while on remand in that city in the Maldives. Whatever the opinion on either side, Nazim told Minivan News the issue of faith or lack thereof was not going away simply because it is ignored. Both the state and the non-state agencies need to, at the very least, acknowledge that there are a substantial number of Maldivians who think about their faith and sometimes question it. Nazim said that acknowledgement of their existence was not tantamount to calling for a secular state, as many seem to assume. And this is this is a very important distinction for him to make because simply by saying, hey, some people don't believe in Islam and we don't want to hide it or we want to talk about it. Some people accuse him of trying to overthrow the government or trying to instill a God forbid. And I mean that literally a secular state. I am calling for a secular state, but I understand why he doesn't want to openly call for a secular state because he, don't, he doesn't want to be that symbol of um the one person who is resisting the government. And then that is also a very common way in which people like him, or even, like I said, progressive Muslims or people who criticize the, uh, the dogmatic narratives of Islam, that is one way in which they get punished. And it's not technically counted as a Sharia law punishment, is they'd be labeled as instigating um, uh, violence or as disturbing the peace or as trying to overthrow the government or some other charge or another, or sometimes bullshit charges that have nothing to do with what was happening. So 
keep that in mind. Don't just look at the number, the underreported number of people who are punished and by cited specific laws about Sharia. Keep in mind that there's so much more to it than that. Moving on. Um, Anyway, so he was saying, but rather, it's it's not tantamount to calling for a secular state, as many seem to assume, but rather the first step towards addressing the problems that inevitably accompany any serious questions regarding faith. Nazim's repentance and return to Islam after his public proclamation that he was not a Muslim happened within days. That is important to remember. So this guy, his entire life, or a lot of his life, not a Muslim, not convinced, and within days... Within days of them counseling him, he believes in Islam. Let me ask you this. How inept was Muhammad as a prophet that it took him years to get a little meager following of a few dozen people or less? Just years to get a few people to follow him before he amassed an army and started to strongman people into joining Islam. But th whoever went to counsel him took him a couple of days. They're that good. They're so good at it that not even a couple of days, you'll see later, it took him a couple of hours. What was Muhammad doing this entire time? Just sitting on his butt when you have these brilliant sheikhs who can convince a guy of joining Islam in hours? Um, makes you think, doesn't it? Reports said that the charge had been the result, the change had been the result of counseling, which Nazim had received while on remand. Details of what followed after his proclamation of apostasy until now have been vague. Remember that uh, Zakir Naik hasn't even answered the question here. Is this guy considered an apostate if he was not a Muslim to begin with, if he was just born in a Muslim family? Guess we'll never find out. However, Nazim added, the death sentence was not mandatory for apostates in Islam. Or, wait, is that Zakir Naik? Yeah, Zakir. It is only if the state itself is Islamic that the death sentence should be the ultimate penalty. The Maldives is a Muslim state, not an Islamic state, Zakir said. Nazim said he sensed the hostility of the audience from the moment he asked the question. Intermittent jeering and calls for violence against him interrupted the rest of his dialogue with Zakir. Once Zakir's answer was over, Nazim chose to return to an aisle seat next near the exit. Despite the strategic decision, a man wearing a long knee-length shirt over baggy trousers, a type of dress relatively new to the Maldives but long favored by Afghans and Pakistani Muslims, he punched Nazim in the neck before he ran towards the police seeking protection. After apparently suspecting initially that Nazim was running at them with hostile intent, the police took him into protection and escorted him to Iskandar Koshi, a, a police barracks not too far from the lecture venue. So their first instinct were to think, were, were, were to think this atheist running towards us has hostile intentions, not the audience shouting violent uh, threats at him, but the atheist probably has bad intentions. Or actually, I've been saying atheist. I don't even know if he's an atheist. Maybe he is, uh, but if I recall correctly, he just said that he doesn't believe in Islam. So to be more accurate, the non-Muslim, let's say that, the non-Muslim here. Some people followed him as he ran to the police station, flanked by policemen. While waiting for the police to decide what was to be done with him, Nazim said a policeman in plain clothes approached him, listened intently and carefully to what he said. He said, I know what you guys are up to. It will never happen in this country, he said ominously before leaving. I don't think this guy was part of an organization that was up to anything, but a lot of Muslims believe that there's some grand conspiracy in the world to defy Islam or to misrepresent or to fight Islam. Uh, it's just called wanting better for the world. It's called progress. It's not because there's a, an organization that's simply targeting Islam specifically. What Islam is going through right now, finally, is something that a lot of religions have gone through over the years. It's just that Muslims think that, or many Muslims think that, that their religion is special, that, that Islam is being targeted because it is the truth and because of hatred against the truth and things like that. No, it's because it's its time. It's time that Islam gets scrutinized. <sighs> Moving on. Nazim said his decision to publicly announce his doubts about Islam was one that he had made his own. He had neither discussed the matter with anyone else nor sought anybody's advice on the matter. Had he simply expressed doubts that I sincerely, he had simply expressed doubts that I sincerely entertained, he said. 
and and I I feel for him because I know that the wise thing to do, what people advise us to do, is to just be quiet. And and I had Muslim friends tell me this, which is, why would you put yourself in danger? Like I'm not saying it's a good thing, but but why? Why wouldn't you just be quiet and let things be? But if nobody does it, then how is there going to be progress? Then we're just going to keep sitting in silence and having no rights and now having our rights transgressed. Um, this is a reminder, by the way, to some ex-Muslims. I'm I'm grateful that I'm not in the Maldives. And just imagine, though, had I traveled and had to land at the Maldives and I wasn't wearing a mask. Imagine if I was a known internet personality, known as a critic of Islam or a hater of Islam, as they say, and I landed in the Maldives. What could happen to me? Uh, I see this trend lately, ever since a certain video that I made a few weeks ago, that some ex-Muslims are very proud of their choice to not to wear a mask. And I mean more power to them. I am glad that they're in the position where they get to do that. But they're demeaning people like myself, or more specifically, they're demeaning me for wearing a mask. But don't you think there are advantages to wearing a mask? I mean, those are the same sort of people who would use an example like this and say, look at how violent Muslims are towards ex-Muslims. Uh, our, our lives are in danger. If anything happened to me, they would almost rejoice because they would use it as an example of the violence of Islam that they've been citing. But at the same time, they demean me for wearing a mask. I don't think that I would ever do what this guy, Muhammad Nazim, did. He, he, it was brave. It was a bit reckless, if not a lot reckless, and we'll see why. I'm trying to be brave in a different way. It doesn't mean that I have to give out my identity. And I don't urge people to take stances like these in a way that might harm them. But we need to keep pushing the boundaries bit by bit. And my way is by wearing a mask. And this is not foolproof. A lot of people out there, including Muslims, already know my identity. Someday it might be leaked. It might not be. But I find it particularly silly for certain ex-Muslims out there to ridicule me or whoever else for wearing a mask and say, I don't get it. You live in a, in a insert country here. You should be fine. How asinine is that take, really? Anyway, moving on. Protective custody or protected by default while in custody? I think we know the answer. Although officially, sorry, I have to read the paragraph before. Uh, Nazim said, I felt as if I was suffocating. The extremism that was taking hold in the Maldives was increasingly so rapid. I could not travel in any vehicle anywhere without having to listen to extremist material, he said. I needed to speak out about it. Although officially under police protection, Nazim was taken to, I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this correctly, uh, Donido, the, the remand prison, and processed as any other accused. He was first put into what he described as a cage. Keep in mind, that was the same night as this lecture, so-called lecture, happened. He was put in a cage named Arrival while the necessary paperwork was done. An investigation by four officers, who Nazim described as invariably pleasant men, lasted around two hours until 2.30 a.m. in the morning. Nazim said that he could see the reasons why an investigation was necessary. As the police noted, his actions had become a national issue. Some of the public reaction also implied that it could threaten public order or even national security. I sense in his tone that Nazim is trying to is trying to be safe. I don't think that he's speaking completely honestly in, in, this, in this article, and I don't fault him for that. If the whole country was out to get me and I was in an Islamic state, I'll say what I need to say to be safe. And he's, he's still trying to push back gently, and he's saying, I'm not saying I want secularism. I, I'm not trying to be that martyr, and I, I think those guys were nice, and I understand why they had to do what they had to do to question me. But in reality, he was not a danger to the country. How is one guy asking one question what is my ruling in Islam? How is that a danger to the Maldives? How fragile is that society? How fragile is this religion? Moving on. Let me make sure this is maximized. Okay. Nazim said he could see the reasons. Yeah, we read that. The unprecedented nature of his actions also meant that the police were unsure whether he had committed an offense as defined in Maldivian law. That is really sad. No one in that entire country has ever done something like that before. So... Very brave of him. He was told he would be held in Don Hindu, Do, Donido, uh, until the investigation was completed. He was there for four nights. He talks a little bit about how um, how terrible the, the situation was. By the way, if you'd like to read this, and I urge you that you do, link is in 
the description below. But he talks for a couple of paragraphs about how disgusting and deplorable the conditions were in there. He was able to talk to his lawyer the following day when he was brought to court to be officially rep uh, remanded. His lawyer also told him that the Human Rights Commission of the Maldivian uh, of, of the Maldivian HRCM would be un would be unlikely to be able to intervene on his behalf as a case of apostasy would not fall within their remit. That is extremely sad to hear. To the two scholars visit. The Ministry of Islamic Affairs appointed two scholars to counsel Nazim while in custody. They arrived on the third day of his detention. Inside half an hour of talking to them, Nazim said he told them he was ready to accept Islam as a faith. Again, I remind you people, Muhammad took years, years to get a few people and then an army and then people started to join. These guys did it in half an hour. How much of a loser was Muhammad compared to these awesome sheikhs who were able to convince a guy in half an hour that Islam is true? Seriously, like, what information do they have? I would love to speak to them to find out what golden secret they have about Islam that would convince this guy. Obviously, this was under duress. Obviously. Moving on. The discussion, he said, was honest. He expressed his doubts openly and agreed that embracing Islam was the best thing for him. Notice the wording, the careful wording here. Embracing Islam was the best thing for him, not because of a God, not because of a hell and heaven, but because of the, the, the agents of God that are alive on this earth, not because of mythology. In a discussion with his lawyer, who had visited him ahead of the scholars, they had both agreed that Nazim's interests would be best served by living as all other Maldivians do, basically not to stray from the crowd. He would be a Maldivian, abide by the laws of the country, and live according to its constitution. An hour after meeting him, a brief counseling session and a prayer performed together, the two religious scholars who had visited Nazim as an apostate left him as a Muslim, subhanAllah. The decision to read the Shahada uh, on national television, he said, was his own. And I understand that decision. If the guy who received infamy for um, for being an apostate wants anything, is for people to leave him alone and not see him as a target. So yes, of course, he wants everyone to think that he's a Muslim, whether or not he is truly a Muslim. And and I'm not and I'm not saying this to incite hate against the guy. Leave him alone. He did nothing but ask a single question. The decision to read the Shahada was his own. His proclamation of apostasy was made in front of an audience, broadcast on national television, and played out across the internet. He needed a public forum to demonstrate his return to the folds of Islam, he said, for his own safety. And he, here I am telling you just in advance, if I'm ever captured somewhere and, and someday Apostle Aladdin is a Muslim again, uh, and it seemed very, uh, you know, very sudden and it doesn't make any sense, this would be why, but I hope that day never comes. It was only after he agreed to revert to Islam, so to speak, as Zakir had referred to the process. I love how the, the this is written. It's 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 a form of um, of defiance, but also trying to not get in trouble. The people who wrote this they they acknowledge that reverting to Islam is not actually something that they necessarily think is real, but that's just what Zakir had referred to the process as. It was only after he agreed to return to Islam that Nazim was allowed a pen and paper, which he had requested numerous times during the time he was held in that city. He had wanted to write to President Muhammad Nasheed as well as international NGOs to highlight his plight. Once born again Muslim, he had pen and paper and a new cell that was far cleaner than the one he had before. He was also allowed to walk and leave the cell at times. He was returned to court in Mali on the fifth day of being held in that city. Once he recited the Shahada in front of the sitting judge, he was told he was a free man. There was no case against him. This is a good reminder of how people say Islam spread so quickly back in the days of Muhammad and, and look at where we are now. I wonder how many people were put in front of a, instead of a judge, a uh, an executor were in war, you know, people who had their towns raided and they were told, convert to Islam or or you and your family become slaves. What do you think they would have chosen? Like that surah, I forget the name of the surah, but uh, have you seen the people uh, entering God, um, God's, God's religion in, in droves? That was after the Fath of Mecca, as they called it, after the conquest of Mecca. 
people have been entering Islam in droves. Why are people convinced in droves the moment that an army takes over their city? Why do you think that is? Is it because they're convinced or because they're coerced? What, what, what was that TikTok, uh, that viral TikTok sound where you, what was it? I'm forgetting it now. Anyway, moving on. And then he was returned to court. Yeah, we read that part. Did Nazim commit a crime? The Article 9A of the Constitution states that anyone who was a Maldivian citizen at the commencement of the 2008 Constitution is a citizen of the Maldives. So he was a, a yes, thank you. It's were you silent or were you silenced? So anyone who was a Maldivian citizen at that time in 2008 continues to be a citizen. Article 9C states that despite the provisions in Article 9A, a non-Muslim cannot become a Maldivian. So Zakir, genius, what is that called? Is that still called a Muslim state? When you literally cannot be a citizen unless you're a Muslim? Or is that an Islamic state? Doesn't seem to matter to me. In between, however, is Article 9b, which is unequivocal and unambiguous in its statement that no citizen of the Maldives may be deprived of citizenship. It does not stipulate any circumstances whatsoever in which a person, once a citizen, can be deprived of their citizenship. The wording of 9a, which states that a non-Muslim may not become a citizen, understood in common parlance, suggests that it applies to those who wish to become a Maldivian. How does this apply to Nazim? Had he not been born a Muslim, according to Naik's opinion on the matter, um, was there a need for him to become one? If he could not be deprived of his citizenship under any circumstance, why would he have had to become a Muslim in order to become Maldivian? That is a good question. I think according to the law, he kind of fit in that loophole of he was already a citizen in 2008, so he doesn't need to become a Muslim. When I did what I did, Nazim said, legally, I was absolutely convinced that there was no way I could not be a Maldivian. They could strip him of his citizenship if he left Islam. How scary is that? Even if it doesn't quite agree with the Constitution, that is even a question. That is terrifying. There is no statutory law covering the issue of apostasy, which means, as stipulated in the Constitution, it is an offense on which the law is silent, to be considered according to Islamic Sharia. Ah. Again, Zakir idiot, um, what does that mean? If the country falls back on Sharia, if something is not in the Constitution. If he remained a non-Muslim and therefore a non-Maldivian, would Sharia still have applied to him? That is an excellent question. Does Sharia apply to non-Muslims? Well, depends on who you ask, but pretty much it seems like yes. A silence similar to the one that Nazim described as forcing Maldivians to keep quiet about questions over their faith appears to hold forte over the, uh, forte over the public and official discourse on the subject of Islam, obviously. So how is his life as the only apostate Maldivian or ex-apostate as, as, as they made him claim? Nazim is an affable, dignified, and unassuming 38-year-old. He is heavily involved in community de development projects, volunteers with many such projects, and is engaged in the development of social policy. The reaction to his declaration of non-belief in Islam, he said, has been mixed. Angry and supportive, superficial and profound. His own friends and colleagues, he said, are uneasy talking about it. Very few have actually discussed it with him. He can feel its presence, however, unspoken yet potent, in his every social interaction with another person. Among the general public, apart from a few threatening text messages and threats left on his wall on Facebook, the reaction has been muted since his public recitation of the Shahada. I mean, I, I can believe that a lot of idiots who are clapping for Zakir Naik actually believe that this guy converted to Islam again. He does not regret what he said. He said somebody had to do it. It needed to be spoken about. The representation, the repression, sorry, the repression of thought, the lack of debate and lack of proper public sphere in which such discussion can take place is dangerous. So before I continue this part, I want to warn people that this is going to be upsetting. This part is going to mention someone who ended his life. So if you want to skip ahead, feel free. He recalled Ismail Muhammad Didi, the 25-year-old air traffic controller who hung himself from the control tower of the Mali International Airport in July after he was ostracized by colleagues, friends, and family when he expressed his doubts about his belief in Islam. One of the two men who publicly expressed their doubts over the faith decided to re-embrace Islam and live life as the Constitution says a Maldivian should. The other decided life was not worth it. Imagine living in a country where you have to be a certain religion to be a citizen. 
And imagine how sad it is that only two people with very different fates, two people in the entire country are known to have said anything critical about a religion. Two people in a country. Doesn't that terrify you? Doesn't that sound like, like a totalitarian state? And I know that a lot of people will say, well, that's not Islam's fault. That is this specific country's expression of Islam's fault. But I fail to see how they deviate far enough from Islam that I, that I think their ideas are original or so devious or so un-Islamic. I think that this is an inevitable consequence. And like I said, whether or not they're following the, the book by the book, you know, whether or not they're following every law in Sharia the way that Allah apparently intended it, which we still don't agree on, is irrelevant because the general sentiment will follow the the spirit of it, which is that someone who detests Islam or leaves Islam or criticizes Islam or anyone who um what is it? Endangers the 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 state of peace that Islam has. That that Islam is afforded this protection from any scrutiny. Anyone who goes against that should be treated worse than murderers and thieves and anyone else who commits a crime. And I know that this might be very cathartic for a lot of Maldivians, and especially Maldivians who are irreligious or ex-religious or just critical of religion. Uh, or progressive, and I've received messages already from Maldivians telling me that they're excited to, to, to hear this coverage. So I hope that this helps in some way. And um, I see a couple of super chats I will address in a bit. Thank you very much for the super chats. Uh, I just want to read a little bit of this report. Again, link is in the description, because I want to give more information, not just conjecture or just one article. This is a 2022 report on international religious freedom in the Maldives. It's from the U.S. Department of State. The Constitution designates Islam as the state religion. Zakir Naik, is this an Islamic state or not? It requires citizens to be Muslim and requires public office holders, including the president, to be followers of Sunni Islam, specifically that version of Islam. The Constitution provides for limitations on rights and freedoms to protect and maintain the tenets of Islam and does not specifically establish religious freedom nor identify religion as a category on which discrimination is prohibited. The law states that both the government and the people must protect religious unity. That should terrify you. Anything that talks about unity can easily be co-opted to harm anyone who doesn't fall into this unity. Um, and if the unity includes having to clap for an idiot like Zakir Naik, I, I want nothing to do with it. So the law states that propagation of any religion other than Islam is a criminal offense. Keep that in mind. A propagation of any religion other than Islam in the Maldives is a criminal offense. The law criminalizes criticism of Islam and speech in a manner likely to cause religious segregation. But keep in mind here, in a manner likely to cause religious segregation doesn't mean if someone says, I will not hire non-Muslims. That is a manner likely to cause religious segregation, or I will mistreat you know, non-Muslims, or something like that. No, they, they mean anything that, that shatters the illusion of unity, or shatters the illusion that that whole country is just Islamic. That is what they mean by, what was that? In a manner likely to cause religious segregation. It's important to read into the meaning of this. The penal code permits the administration of certain sharia punishments, such as flogging, stoning, and amputation of hands. This is not some invention to make Islam look bad. This is actually in sharia. This is stuff that happened during the days of the Prophet, that he administered those punishments. This is what we're supposed to believe is the best way to live our lives for the rest of time, till God gets off his throne and ends all of this and starts judging us one by one and taking personal offense to how many times we didn't or did say his name. That's the religious narrative. The Ministry of Islamic Affairs, MIA, continued to maintain control over all matters related to religion and religious belief, including requiring imams to use government-approved sermons in Friday services. The government continued to prohibit residents and uh, resident foreigners and foreign tourists from practicing any religion other than Islam in public. Okay, so you hear a lot about freedom of religion in countries, especially in secular countries. And, and this, this is what's bizarre to me. If you go to a secular country, which a lot of Muslims want a better life, 
And a lot of Muslims aren't sitting there thinking, I love Sharia law. I would love to have a country ruled by Sharia. I, I want Islam to run the world. A lot of Muslims don't think that way. They move to a country that is secular, where religion and state are separate. And then you have people like Tanya Hakikachu or whoever else of these Dawah people telling us how much better life is under Islamic rule. Would it really, would they want to live in a state where they're not allowed to practice Islam whatsoever? They're not allowed to say their hateful uh, drivel about how they would execute people if they could. Uh, they're not allowed to even do a prayer. They're not allowed to fast or tell people to uh, please appreciate that we're fasting and you know we can't eat. They're not, not allowed to say any of that. Do you think that they would want to live in that state? Of course not. They, they think that the world would be a utopia if we follow Islam, but especially a utopia for Muslims. But I'm telling you, even for Muslims, living in a Sharia law land is hell. Not even Muslims want to live that way. It's just this, um, this longing for a an alternative reality that will never be and could never be. It's it's like an excuse to say things would have been better. It's only because of those evil secularists. And they use secular as some kind of filthy word. Without secularism, these Dao men couldn't say what they want to say in these countries. So remind yourself, when someone says that the world would be better in an Islamic state, try to help them think, would you want to live in a state that treats you like a non-Muslim in an Islamic state. In September, here's an example, the Maldives police service arrested three Indian nationalists for possession of an idol in Belidu Island, but later deported them without charges. Oh, thank God, they were so generous. Imagine arresting someone, imagine arresting someone because they have a necklace that says Allah on it. That's the equivalent of that. Imagine arresting someone because they have a cross. On June 21st, a group of men armed with flags and water bottles attacked participants at an event organized by the government and the Indian High Commission to mark the International Day of Yoga. Imagine attacking people doing, doing yoga because you think it's pagan or something. They're doing yoga. How can they hurt you? At most, they might hurt their own backs if they do it wrong, but they're not going to hurt you. Insanity. In the days leading up to the event, religious non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and scholars asked authorities to stop the event. Religious NGOs, that's just such an oxymoron. Um, saying it encouraged Hindu practices and thus was irreligious. No, it's not irreligious. I don't know if yoga specifically is a Hindu practice, especially in that event. But even if it were, I don't see the crime in practicing their religion publicly if you get to do it in other countries too. And scholars asked authorities to stop the event, saying it encouraged Hindu practices and thus was irreligious. Oh, by irreligious, they mean not Muslim. Because let, let me get you into the, um, the mindset of some believers. And I've had this conversation so many times, it's frustrating. When you say, what if Christianity is true, or what if Hinduism turns out to be true, or what if some other religion turns out to be true? They say, no, 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 that's not possible, because Islam is the only actual religion. Everything else is false. I mean, you could say that Christianity and Judaism stemmed from the same religion, but they've deviated, blah, blah, blah. But anything else outside of the Abrahamic religions is not even a religion. It's a false religion. Um, so they don't even, they, they, they see it as it's irreligious because religion, by definition, deen, religion, is Islam and nothing else. They are incapable, those people are incapable of comprehending that the way that they view their religion to be valid, someone else views theirs to be valid. And that neither of them has any basis to say that my religion is valid, like to actually prove that their religion is valid. In my view, as someone who's irreligious, who's truly irreligious, both of them are just as justified in their belief, which is not really based on, like I said, facts or anything that could be verified or that could be communicated in a way that is verifiable. So to me, they're, they're both religious. Moving on. Um, the MPS arrested 21 men immediately following the incident for doing yoga. NGOs continue to report the, that persistent online and in-person threats against individuals perceived to be insufficiently Muslim effectively foreclose the possibility of meaningful discussion of religious issues in the country. 
it's not just for practicing a different religion if you're not Muslim enough. NGOs continue to report instances of individuals deemed secularists or apostates receiving death threats and being cyberbullied. NGOs reported that authorities continue to fail to act against online death threats and hate speech against those perceived to be critical of Islam. I believe that. I still have to, I want to read this next section, but I, I encourage you to, to read this on your own. Demographics. While most citizens follow Sunni Islam, which is a requirement of citizenship in the Maldives, there are no reliable estimates of religious affiliations. Most foreign workers are likely Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, or Christian, although there are no reliable estimates available for the number of followers of different faiths among foreign workers. I'm not surprised. And I want to remind everyone, by the way, um, I don't know if I should say this, but but this is my personal opinion. I'm not going to the Maldives anytime soon, even if I wasn't apostate Aladdin. And, and I don't wish harm for the people of the Maldives. I don't think that all of them are malicious or they realize the dogma that they're following. But I don't want to support the economy of a country that is 100% Islamic, that is to this extent harmful to anyone who's not a Muslim. So maybe putting economic pressure on the government might open it up. I mean, the way that Saudi Arabia is more open these days is because of money. Money makes, makes the world go around. So I'm certainly not going on vacation uh, to the Maldives anytime soon. Uh, even if I could afford it right now. So, status of government respect for religious freedom. The constitution states that the, that the country is a republic based on principles of Islam and designates Islam as the state religion, which it defines in terms of Sunni teachings. Zakir and Naik, are you listening? It states citizens have a duty to preserve and protect Islam. Not Allah, but citizens. And again, I remind you people, Allah is powerless. Allah is an idea. Allah is not real. It's the people who act. So we can change people's behavior. Yeah, it's true. We can't challenge or defeat an, an infinitely powerful entity, but it's a good thing that he doesn't exist. So changing people's minds is possible, but challenging an infinite God, it's, it's presented as a false dichotomy. Either you believe in Islam or you think that you're an arrogant um, hateful entity and you think that you're more powerful than a hypothetical maximally powerful entity but that's not the real question here the question is can you convince people that that entity doesn't exist because it actually does not and the bigger problem is not just belief in God it's belief in God that said I want you to behave this way or I want you to live your life this way and I want you to harm people this way that is what I take issue with not that people believe in God or the afterlife and um, a question that I want to take this question before I continue from Secular Spirit, a question for you that recently came up for me. Would you rather live in a Christian majority or Islam majority country? The way that it stands right now in, in this time and place, probably a Christian majority country, obviously. But had that been a while ago, I don't know if that would be the same answer. Effectively, what I'm trying to say here is that Christianity has gone through that process of revision and progress and dilution. Islam has not. And they have very different paths. I don't know if Islam needs the same amount of time or less time or more time. They're working with different timelines because now we have the internet, which is, you, you could see it as a good thing. It could also be a bad thing because we've already codified and preserved a lot of texts that cannot be easily rewritten. Um, so I think right now, as it stands, the answer would be Christian. But throughout the the the, the decades and the, um, the decades, the centuries, I don't know if that would be the same answer. Shadi says, Christian country for safety, etc. Islamic country for food. Yeah, secret Christian confirmed. All right, back to the back to what we were reading. Uh, the Constitution states. Wait one second. According to the Constitution, non-Muslims may not obtain citizenship. The Constitution states citizens are free to engage in activities not expressly prohibited by Sharia, but it stipulates that people's majlis, the parliament, may pass laws limiting rights and freedoms to protect and maintain the tenets of Islam. In deciding whether a limitation on a right or freedom is constitutional, the Constitution states a court must consider the extent to which the right or freedom must be limited to protect Islam. The law criminalizes violence against individuals based on their religion or calls for violence against individuals based on their religion with sentences of up to four years and two years respectfully. Um, here's the thing, though. Is someone who's irreligious 
do they get afforded that protection? Because if you're not religious, does that mean that it, do they consider that to be a religion? Do you still get protected? Uh, or do people who send threats against you, do they get charged with the same crime? Or do you have to have a specific religion? Like would would hate towards a Hindu maybe be persecuted, but hate towards a ex-Muslim atheist not? Um, and it doesn't matter either way. Because a law is a law only if it is, it's only useful if it is applied. And obviously, people in that crowd can shout things at that guy and hit him and not get arrested. But he gets arrested for asking a question. I don't think this law really is even that relevant. The Constitution states individuals have a right to freedom of thought and expression, but only in a matter not contrary to the tenets of Islam. Uh, what do I say to that that is not um, worthy of censoring? Yeah, well, that's not freedom of thought then. that That's a, a specific set of thoughts that you're allowed to have. The law prohibits the conversion of a Muslim to another religion. Keep that in mind. Imagine living in a country where you cannot convert to Islam or any religion. You cannot leave your current religion. By law, a violation may result in the loss of the convert's citizenship, although a judge may impose a harsher punishment per sharia ah jurisprudence. So if someone leaves Islam and is no longer a Muslim, sharia ah can still apply to them. Isn't that crazy? Although the law, although the law does not stipulate such punishment, sharia ah jurisprudence is often understood by the public and religious scholars to provide for the death penalty in cases of, of conversion from Islam. For instance, apostasy. But the government has made no such statement. The law states both government and the people must protect religious unity, or the perception of religious unity. Any statement or action found to be contrary to this objective is subject to criminal penalty. Specific infractions include, include expressing religious beliefs other than Islam, disrupting religious unity, and having discussions or committing acts that promote religious differences. This could be anything. You could send a text message with a meme to your friend about like the meme that I posted about the solar eclipse and how uh, it, it, that was even a meme that, that some Muslims have shared. Like it's, it's not really a hateful meme or anything. The, the, the joke being that Muslims can eat during the couple of minutes or whatever of totality during the eclipse be, because it was Ramadan, but the sun is gone. Uh, that could get you in, you know, that could get you punished over there because you're having discussions or committing acts that promote religious differences. Heck, if even if you maybe are a Shia Muslim or you want to talk about Shia versus Sunni Islam, you might be promoting religious differences in that country. The list of infractions also includes delivering religious sermons in a way that infringes upon the independence and sovereignty of the country or limiting the rights of a specific section of society. So, yeah, you might pay up to $1,300 in imprisonment for two to five years or deportation for foreigners. But hey, they could strip you of your citizenship and where do they go if someone is not a Maldivian anymore? I wonder if they have had that case happen yet. Laws criminalize speech breaking Islamic tenets, breaching social norms, or threatening national security. The penal code criminalizes criticism of Islam. According to the law, a person commits the offense of criticizing Islam by engaging in religious oration or criticism of Islam in public or a public medium with the intent to cause disregard for Islam, producing, selling, and distributing material criticizing Islam, I, I can't tell you how many books that could apply for. I mean, I have books behind me that aren't, you know, this is why I left Islam or this is why Islam is false, but they make mention of religions, including Islam, and they make mention of facts that go against the religious narrative. That could be bad enough. If you have that as an ebook on 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 your on your ebook reader, if you have that as a, a paper book, you could get in trouble for this. Producing, selling, or distributing material. Criticizing Islam. Producing, selling, distributing, importing, disseminating, or possessing idols of worship. If you have a Buddha, if you have a, a keychain Buddha, right, that, that could get you in trouble. And are attempting to disrupt the religious unity of the citizenry and conversing and acting in a manner likely to cause religious segregation. Again, we talked about what they think religious segregation is, not what it actually is and or insulting or spreading misinformation about Islam. Here's the thing, though. You could say Muhammad married a child and it is fully Islamic, and they would consider that misinformation about Islam. It's, it's very confusing. It's very confusing. Allah, the Prophet, or Sunnah through an act or expression in a public forum. Shias, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there because you're not safe there. Even if you're the wrong kind of Muslim, you're not safe there. 
using a communications device or otherwise with the intention of undermining Islam. Yo, imagine texting to undermine Islam. That, that is Allah's weakness. Allah is powerless. Allah shakes at his knees when people talk about him, when people criticize his religion, when people send memes and messages about him. That is, that is pathetic, isn't it? Without people, Allah is, Allah is nothing. Allah is an idea. Lastly, uh, individuals convicted of these offenses are subject to imprisonment up to one year. Well, if you read the, uh, the terrible situation that Muhammad Nazim was put in, that is not a nice prison to be in. And I'm sure they would do a lot of bad things to you in there. Um, so I, I want to read a super chat here. Thank you. AS, uh, ASNSR for noticing and Christina is asking one Muslim how did you feel about reading the Quran lots of mixed feelings and I'm going to talk about this in, in an upcoming video or something related to this um, how did I feel about reading the Quran I was supposed to memorize it so most of the time I was focusing on okay this is the next word this is the next word and oh, I got this word wrong I wasn't thinking always too deeply about the words but it often stressed me out because it was a reminder that there's something that I'm not getting about this. There's something about this that feels wrong and, I, and I, I can't seem to make sense of this religion. And it was just a stressor all the time. This punishment, that punishment. And even if I didn't think that I was the subject of uh, or, or, or the person receiving the punishment, it was just stressful to keep reading verses about punishment all the time. And it was kind of boring sometimes. Even as a Muslim, I had these thoughts and then I felt guilty about them. It was boring the repetitiveness of how much like these are the good people, these are the bad people. Okay, we get it, but where's where's the meat? Where, where's the proof? Um, so I hope that answers that. Even as a Muslim, I had my doubts and I had my guilty doubts, and and um, I, I I have to say though, sometimes it was the cadence of it made it easier to memorize. There are certain parts where I can almost guess the next word because of how I'm expecting it to sound. Um, so yeah. Good stuff. I I might go back to um, I I used to back when I was on TikTok. I used to read Quran to prove to the Muslims who say I was never a Muslim to prove to them that I can I can read it pretty well. Um, this this is a sentiment that I want to address here before I go. Amusing. Aladdin isn't Muslim anymore, but still pronounces Allah as a Muslim. It's an Arabic word. So I I, I get this. Um, this sort of comment a lot saying why do you still pronounce this that way why are you still there's still muslim in you that the i don't know if that's what this commenter is implying but um you have to understand that i this is my native tongue so yes of course i'm going to pronounce words correctly i'm not going to say islam to appease people it's islam and sometimes i might accidentally code switch and say islam but i say islam because that's how it sounds like in arabic that's allah is allah um so yeah, it's it's not because I'm secretly dog whistling the Muslims or there's still some Islam in me. It's just the correct way to pronounce a word. Anyway, I hope that Muhammad Lazim is safe now. And I hope that even though it's been so many years that Maldivians who are watching this now, if they're out there, I hope that you know that you are not forgotten, that we know that you exist, that even if you can't talk about this because it is unsafe, we would like to talk about this. Um, I want to remind you of how unempathetic and hateful a lot of these preachers tend to be. Someone like Zachary Naik even making jokes about this guy's death, uh, just nonchalantly talking about, yeah, death penalty, this, death penalty, that, not thinking for one second how terrible it must feel, even if this guy is wrong about being an atheist or about God being real or Islam being true. He doesn't think for one second, man, it must suck to be the only atheist in the Maldives. It must be really scary. Uh, he, he could be harmed at any moment. He doesn't think about any of that. Zakir Naik is a terrible, terrible person. He's an imbecile, as I said earlier. The way that he talks to Muslims, ex-Muslims, whoever, he just brings people on, on stage up to the mic to say something and usually praise him and everybody claps for him. But when he's faced with even the, the slightest bit of resistance, even from a Muslim, he buckles. He starts shouting. He starts sounding like uh, a jerk because that's who he is underneath and i hope that people like him get taken down a notch or two i hope that through work like this we disarm them of this this holy aura that they carry with them uh, i hope that people realize he's just some guy i don't care who gave him a degree as a doctor i would not let him give me 
an injection, let alone uh, help me with anything medical. So um, yeah, I don't know. If you want more Zakir Naik videos, let me know. I used to think that idiots like Zakir Naik and Danny Hakikachu and other people like them are not even worth discussing or responding to because it is common sense. It's obvious. What they say is extremely false. But then I realized it's not extremely obvious to a lot of people. And if that's what the people want, then that's what the people will get. Someone has to do it. Someone needs to do this kind of commentary. So if you'd like more, let me know in the comments below. Stay tuned because coming up next on this channel are a few interesting videos and live streams. I don't want to give away too much, but um, I got this the idea for this specific live stream because of a someone who reached out to me. Um, and I would like to remind people that if you would like to reach out to the community, if you'd like to be a part of the community, it's very easy. Just join the Discord server. Uh, you can just be a, a patron or YouTube member of this channel. And the instructions are in the description below on how to link your Discord account and join the server. And yeah, I would like to thank everyone for their support, especially the YouTube members and donors and uh, patrons. Uh, I could not do this without you. So thank you, everyone whose names are listed here and those whose names are not listed. And thank you for watching. And as always, think critically and think for yourself.